Hello, Troy Ryan Wood here, broadcasting from self-quarantine with a new update from the 3D Printing Doctor Who project. Most of you are stuck at home right now, so I figured this was a good time to record a new video to discuss some big developments that will be affecting the project moving forwards, and as always, to show off the latest batch of figures that you can now download and print from 3dprintingdoctorwho.com. But before I go into that, first I want to say thank you to all the lovely people on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook who have been giving a shout out to the project lately. Uh, I started making these figures for my own amusement, but it really helps keep me motivated and doing what I'm doing when I see other people printing and enjoying them too, uh, especially when their painting skills are so much better than mine. I have to say that painting is probably my least favorite part of the project and the easiest part to screw up. So it's really great to see what happens when somebody who's really good at that sort of thing uh, is able to take one of my designs and really take it to the next level. Uh, showing off just how good it could look with a professional quality paint job and finish. Um, so to all the customizers out there, I love seeing your work and I appreciate you telling people where the designs came from. Uh, so please keep posting them and anybody else out there who's had fun making these figures, please head over to our Facebook group and uh, share your photos and comments. In my last video, I talked about redesigning the lineup to work with both standard FDM filament printers as well as resin printers like the Anycubic Photon and LNU Mars, uh, which have become more commonplace these days. My first 25 figures were originally designed to be printed using standard PLA filament on FDM printer because that's what I happened to have at the time. Uh, but last summer, I purchased an Anycubic Photon resin printer and discovered that while the quality is a drastic improvement over regular filament printing, there are significant differences in hardness and flexibility between the two materials, so several of the old snap-together elements simply wouldn't work if you just attempted to print the same figure out of resin without modification. So retrofitting the old designs to work in both formats is kind of a long and boring task and something I'm still chipping away at, but I hope to eventually have most of it done by next year. In the meantime, please consult the grid at the top of the templates page to determine which type of material the design has been formatted to work with. One of the downsides of the Photon and other similarly priced entry-level resin printers is that they have a comparatively tiny build area, typically only about 2.5 by 4.5 inches across, which isn't big enough to print most of the larger figures or vehicles. But there's a new generation of resin printers just hitting the market which have much larger build areas, nearly the same size as a conventional filament printer. These are ridiculously expensive at the moment, but as with a lot of cutting edge technology, as new companies enter the market and start releasing their own versions, we should start to see the prices come down. This is how it was with regular 3D printers about five years ago, and I expect to see the same sort of pattern continue with resin printers. So in a few years, you'll probably be able to get one for about $300-$500, instead of the whopping $2,000 or so that they cost now. Well, I promised you some big news in 3D printing, and it doesn't get much bigger than this. This is the Frozen Transform, one of the biggest and baddest resin printers on the home market. It has a massive print area of 11 and a half by 6 and a quarter inches. And it has over 15 inches of vertical print space. How big is that? Big enough to print an entire character option scale Bessie or Whomobile as a single piece with a little bit of room left over. Now in a sort of good news, bad news situation, I signed up to pre-order this printer back in December, thinking, hey, I've got three months to which to sell my old Moue 130 and a few of my less than perfect prototype figures to help offset the cost. Then of course the coronavirus happened, the entire planet went into lockdown, about half the population lost their jobs, or at least a good chunk of their disposable income. So even though I have this new printer, it's now really hard to get resin, alcohol, gloves, masks, paper towels, and most of the other supplies used for 3D printing, since all that stuff is being prioritized to make PPE for doctors, nurses, and other people who need it a hell of a lot more than I do. So I've still got a couple of bottles of resin left, but this thing takes an entire full bottle of resin just to fill the reservoir tank halfway. So I probably won't be using it a whole lot for large-scale prototyping, at least not until this whole thing blows over. And even though I have a supersized resin printer, this isn't really going to significantly change my design process that much, as I'm still going to use a smaller Photon as my design standard for resin printing, because that's what most people have. But I will start creating options to print larger scale figures and vehicles that would otherwise have to be split into chunks as solid pieces for those who do happen to have uh, the option of using a larger sized printer. Now comes the fun part of showing off the figures I've been designing in the last few months, as well as revealing some of what's coming down the pipeline. Figure number 29 is the Raston Warrior Robot from The Five Doctors. I've had a lot of requests for this one over the years, but it took me several years of tinkering to get to the point where I was reasonably certain I could pull it off. 
This was my first attempt at printing a fully articulated humanoid figure in 5.5 inch scale, and a bit of an experiment to see whether it was even possible to do so. While I've done some bigger monster figures, like the Yeti and the Tower and Wood Beast, uh, there were a lot of things I had to redesign from the ground up on this one, especially since I was trying to make something that could be printed in both PLA and resin with minimal modification. As I've done with some of my other recent figures, the elbows and knees are designed to use slot-in 1.5mm brass rods as pivot points, since they'd be too flimsy and breakable if I printed them out of regular plastic. I like the 1.5mm brass rods since they're quite strong for their size, but also easy to cut by hand with a regular pair of wire cutters. You can find them in most craft or hobby stores if they have a model making section, or just buy them online from Amazon or eBay. You can also use toothpicks or wire coat hangers in a pinch, though you may need to widen the holes a bit to make them fit. I based my articulation design on the old G.I. Joe toys from the 1980s, but I recently found out that the official character options figures aren't really all that dissimilar in the way that they are put together, except that their parts are mostly pop and lock and assembled when the figure is still hot and the plastic is soft and malleable. The plastic used in filament and resin printers is significantly more rigid and comes out of the machine cold, so I had to opt for a more old school approach and create a split torso design that can be glued and placed around the neck, shoulders, and waist pivots, locking them in place but still allowing for rotational movement. Now this is for the resin version. The PLA version does use a solid torso with pop in place arms, necks, and hip joints, though that does mean that this version doesn't have a waist pivot. And here we have the finished figure itself. As you can see, it's got some lovely articulation, uh, can stand upright on its own, or at least mostly, and can be posed in a variety of different positions. He's also got some accessories in the form of some spare lances and a tiny little wrist mount that can be used to hold them in place if you want to pose him with one. Now, these are all resin printed, but I do know that people have managed to successfully print the figure using regular filament on a standard FDM printer. Uh, it'll just be a little less defined, and the layer lines will be significantly more visible. If you're wondering why I've got three examples on display here, it's because it took me multiple attempts to get the elbows and hips articulation just right. While I have managed to one and done a few of my recent figures, in most cases, even when I know exactly how the articulation should work, there's usually at least some part of the figure that I have to reprint because it didn't turn out quite right. And here's a good example. Um, the very first version of the figure that I tried was more or less in a crouching posture, sort of like the Bach figure that came in the Daemon set, but I discovered that the hips and shins looked really funky when you tried to rotate them into a standing position, so I ended up going back to the drawing board and redesigning the bottom half to be more or less upright, but still have a little bit of bend at the knees. I'd originally intended to add some rotational joints to the shoulders so that the arms could be outstretched and posed in a wider variety of positions, but the figure ended up being just a little bit too skinny to pull that off, so I had to compromise and just make them slightly outstretched. Uh, my major headache with this model is still the elbows, though. Again, because the figure is so skinny, there isn't a lot of room to position the joints, so there's not much preventing the elbows from bending back in the opposite direction rather than stopping when the arm is out straight. I slightly tweaked this on the most recent build, uh, so it's better than it was before, but you can still force them all the way around if you really try. Uh, on most of these ones, I've added a tiny drop of UV resin to the back of the joint, uh, which gives it a little bit more realistic range of movement. There's not a ton of surface detail here, but I tried to replicate what I could. Uh, of course, you've got the fingers stuck in the Vulcan salute, or possibly Suntaran if we're staying in-universe. Uh, we've got a little bit of a seam running up the center of the chest and the crotch area, uh, which is definitely a little bit of uh, magic of David Bowie. Um, I don't know who the actor was, but I'm assuming he was a ballet dancer, judged by the extremely muscular thighs, but fairly normal-looking shins. Uh, he's got his little silver go-go boots, uh, which is a slightly shinier color of silver than the flatter gray bodysuit. Uh, the head is polished mirror chrome, which looks really nice in this resin version. Uh, for that, I use this stuff called Spaz Sticks uh, airbrush paint, which is great stuff even if you don't have an airbrush. Uh, first, you put down a smooth black backing layer and then paint the mirror chrome over the top of it, and it comes out really nicely reflect reflective. Uh, I use the same stuff on the boots, but without the black backing, and you can see that they aren't quite as shiny. Um, on the back here, we've got the visible vertebrae, which I'm fairly certain is just where they stitched up the back once the actor climbed inside. 
Uh, we've got his Love Handles uh, and his Raston Crack, uh, which came out slightly less chiseled uh, during the printing process. And uh, just to show you how obsessive compulsive I am about details, one thing I included but you can't actually see because it's right where the two halves of the torsos join, uh, they actually had a tiny little rip in his suit about halfway down the, uh, the left-hand side, uh, which I did replicate. It is there. Uh, you just can't see it on the finished version of the model. Anyway, so there's the Rastons. Next up is figure number 30, Megalos. But not the version that looks like Tom Baker, or even the dorky ginger guy in glasses. No, this is just the regular old houseplant version. This was the semi-traditional April Fool's Day joke figure for 2020, where every year I try to create the least desirable Doctor Who figure I can think of, even though I don't think I'll ever be able to top the destroyed Cassandra figure that got released as part of the official toy range. Those who follow the project on Facebook know that every time I try to do one of these, it invariably goes wrong and ends up being a massive headache that usually stretches on until May or even June. But this time I actually made it to the April 1st deadline, even though I didn't turn out quite as I planned. Megalos, in his cactus form, has zero points of articulation, except that with my version, you do have the option to print the cactus hollow out of the flexible resin or filament like TPU or Ninja Flex, which means that in theory you can make it deflate, as seen in the episode. There's a circular loop hidden up inside the tip of the cactus that you're supposed to be able to thread a bit of string around, which then goes down through the base and out a hole in the back, so you can pull on it and make Megalos collapse, or at least wiggle a bit. Unfortunately, even when printing out of 100% tenacious resin, I couldn't get this feature to work my resin test print. I haven't tried it with Ninja Flex, which is significantly more flexible, but I suspect to make it work, the walls need to be thinner than they currently are, but not so thin that they collapse or tear during printing. I might try playing around with this one a little bit later to see if I can get it to work better, but for right now, it's just a regular old cactus sitting on a footstool. Figure 31 is a bit of an odd one in that it's a combination pack consisting of the junk mail robot and spy kites from Greatest Show in the Galaxy. This started out as a quick and dirty remix of an excellent design by James Kiersey to bring it into 5.5 inch scale and make it 3D printer friendly, but similar to what happened with Smappy's 8th Doctor console room, I ended up ripping it apart and putting it back together again from scratch to make it absolutely as screen accurate as I could get, given that the prop only appeared on screen for a couple seconds and never made it to Blackpool or Longleat, so there are really no good photos of what it looks like up close. James also included some juggling pins for the 7th Doctor with his design, so not to be outdone, I decided to throw in a spy kite and the Psychic Circus eye medallion and turn this into one general hodgepodge of material from Greatest Show in the Galaxy. And here are the finished figures themselves. As you can see, they came out absolutely glorious, even though many of the pieces are under 2 millimeters in width. Uh, the spy kites in particular came out wonderful. I'm rather pleased with the 80s-ness of the colors. Uh, and again, I'm using Spaz Sticks airbrush paint here. And these are the colors that came straight out of the bottle. Uh, I've also got a bottle of blue and pink that I haven't even had a chance to use yet, so I'll uh, eventually have one of each color. You do have to be careful and make sure you angle these correctly while printing. Uh, I printed the first orange one here flat, and the back came out badly distorted. But then I switched it to about a 40 degree angle on the next two, and it came out absolutely flawless on both sides. Uh, these are all resin printed, so I don't know how well they'll uh, work on a standard filament printer. Uh, for resin printing, I'd highly recommend using some Soraya Tech uh, Tenacious Flexible Resin as an additive. Uh, probably at, at least like a 50-50% mix mixture with Elegoo white or gray uh, for both the kites and the skinnier elements of the junk mail robots. Uh, Tenacious costs about twice as much as regular resin, but it's just an invaluable tool to have around if you have any intent on playing with your figures or displaying them somewhere where they might uh, fall over or get bent. Uh, it really increases the durability of them. Uh, so here are the juggling pins. Uh, they turned out fairly well. Uh, these ones will probably print in a regular FDM uh, filament as long as you print them with the built-in triangular supports rather than the auto-generated ones that your uh, slice software will generate. Uh, I'm not even sure if you even see this eye medallion. It may just be too small to zoom in on. Um, uh, this one didn't turn out particularly well. Uh, out of about a dozen or so prints, uh, only a couple of them had any sort of visible surface detail. Uh, but on the plus side, if anybody wants a cosplay prop, uh, all you have to do is blow up the original mesh figure uh, about 13 times bigger, and uh, you can print it uh, actual sized. And uh, now we'll come to the junk mail robot, and I'm amazed at how well this one turned out. Uh, it's 
it really blows my mind at how lovely it looks. Uh, the points on the antenna are like literally the smallest thing I've ever printed. Uh, they may actually be less than a single millimeter wide. I did manage to give this one some articulation. Uh, once you put it all together, the antenna spins and its central plug uh, comes out and can uh, stretch out and actually latch onto the TARDIS console uh, as you see it do in the episode. Uh, this particular bit was a little bit tricky to pull off. Uh, and after trying a bunch of different materials, I found that this 40-pin IDC ribbon cable is the absolute perfect mix of strength and flexibility uh, so that you can make it hover in the air but still retract up inside the body. Uh, you can buy a roll for about 10 bucks. Uh, I've got the link on my website. Um, and then you just cut off about... Uh, uh, three and a half inch length and uh, peel off just the gray wire uh, then before you glue the figure all the way together uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna thread the wire through this black through this back hole uh, knot it at one end uh, and then uh, attach the other end to the pro part with uh, with crazy glue uh, I also recommend crazy gluing the solar panels in place uh, before you seal it up completely uh, you can leave them loose, but they tend to flop around and look a little ugly that way. Uh, I do leave the head free rotating. Um, you don't actually see it rotate on the on the actual uh, prop itself, but uh, you can glue that in place as well if you want. There's a very faint eye pattern on the front end, so if you do glue it, uh, make sure it's facing the right direction if you do. The final figure I have to show off today is figure number 32, the Vord. From Keys of Marinus. I started working on this one almost a year ago, uh, long before the Rastron Warrior robot, but ran into numerous problems that forced me to take a step back and work on an easier model first. 90% of my figure design takes place in Tinkercad, which is great if you want to create precisely measured geometric shapes, but it's not a sculpting tool. For that, I had to teach myself how to use Mesh Mixer, uh, but I quickly discovered that to do what I wanted it to do, I needed to jump back and forth between both pieces of software, which ended up being far more complicated than you might think, because Tinkercad has an extremely low maximum polygon limit and will automatically reduce anything you import or export out of it that has too much surface detail. Uh, Mesh Mixer has no such polygon limit, but absolutely hates flat or uniformly geometric surfaces, and will turn them into an unusable, misshapen garbage if you happen to bring the sculpting tool anywhere near them. So to get the two programs to work together was a massive juggling act. On this figure, I was able to do something that I wasn't able to do on the Raston Warrior robot, which is introduce a new shoulder pivot design that gives the figure a full 360 degree range of arm movement. Uh, again, we're using 1.5 millimeter brass rods for the pivot points, and because of this, both the PLA and SLA versions have a clamshell chest design. The only major difference is the amount of service detail, and the PLA versions have some added supports that will help some of the thinner pieces print. So here's the final printed versions, and uh, as with the Raston, I've got a few different examples to show off because I was having the exact same issues getting the elbow pivots lined up correctly so that they'll bend in the correct direction. Uh, the first two prototypes I printed actually ended up bending the opposite way of how they were supposed to, so I had to make some post-printing modifications using UV resin and now they've got an extremely limited range of forearm movement. Uh, this one on the right is also a little bit smaller than the other two, since I was still zeroing in the size on that first printing. You're probably going to have a hard time seeing all the detail on these figures, because they're so black they just suck up any light you throw at them, uh, but they do look lovely. Uh, with the resin printing, you can see all the little lines and seams on the wetsuits. Um, I've tried to reproduce them as faithfully as I can. Uh, and as you can probably see, we've got all three different antenna types represented here as well to indicate the three different ranks. Uh, these are all swappable and just slot in place, though they're a bit of a tight fit. Uh, so if you want to, you can print three different figures if you want to do some army building, or just pick one and uh, whichever antenna you like best and use that one. Uh, one thing some of you might be asking is where's the diagonal sash and belt? Uh, and the answer to that is that there were three different Ward costumes used during the filming of Keys of Marinus, and only one of them had a diagonal sash. Uh, even though it only appears in the very first episode, for some reason this is the version everybody seems to remember, uh, probably because it had a fairly iconic scene where it's about to attack Susan. Uh, but this costume had an entirely different cut of wetsuit to the other two, uh, and it would have been far more difficult to sculpt, so I want the more standardized look used by the other two Ward. 
There was also a photo call after filming with Carol Ann Ford and the actor wearing the outfit with the, with the triangular antenna that uh, showed the costume from a number of different angles and much better lighting. So that's the one I chose to use as my base model. So that's it for the latest figure releases. I had planned to talk a little bit about some of the brand new figures and figure upgrades you can expect to see coming in the near future, as well as some very exciting collaboration projects going on right now with some of the other designers over on the 3D Printing Doctor Who Facebook group. But this video is already pushing past the 20 minute mark and I'm getting tired of talking, so you're just going to have to check it out for yourself or wait till the next video. Until then, don't forget to like and hit subscribe. Join me over on Facebook and Instagram if you want the latest scoop on what the 3D Printing Doctor Who project is working on next. Farewell for now.